The groundbreaking a and &E series, 60 Days In, returns with a new season. Seven new undercover volunteers are ready to go inside of one of the most dangerous jails and live among the inmates in the hopes of bringing reform. There's only one problem. In this place, there's nowhere to hide, making the experiment more intense and dangerous than ever. Who will fold under pressure and who will stay undercover long enough to make it to the end? Find out in a new season of 60 Days In, new episodes Thursday at 9, 8 central on a and &E. This one goes out to all you craft real mayo lovers. To the sniffers, making excuses to run to the kitchen to open a jar and take a big whiff. And to the dippers, slathering their sandwiches in velvety smooth mayo and then dipping them in even more mayo. You just can't get enough, can you? And I haven't forgotten the fry painters. Some say frites, some say chips, but you all use that French fry golden goodness to deliver craft real mayo straight to your mouth. Let your mayo freak flag fly. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to remind you that organized crime is harder than it looks. Here is the captain. Yeah, I'm stripping these cards like Tim Riggins. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We are loving our selection for today's show. Today in the garage, we are drinking Clockwork by our good friends over at BrewDog. Clockwork is a tangerine-infused IPA brewed right here in Ohio. This is an old-time favorite that is back for a limited time, so don't delay because you will want to stock up now. This is a fierce tangerine IPA that is hoppy and features honey aromas. Garage Grade 4 and three quarter bottle caps out of five and let's give some praise and thanks to our friends for helping us fill up our fridge for this week first up a big shout out to sam and freddie listening in beautiful denver and last but certainly not least we have a double fisted cheers that goes out to minnie and michelle from morgantown west virginia everyone we just mentioned captain they went to our website truecrimegarage.com and clicked on the pint glass helped us out and for that we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, we have bonus content through the Apple Podcast app. All you have to do is subscribe. It's $5.95 per month, and it really goes a long way to supporting the garage, flying garage ship. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This week's episode takes us to Germany as we examine one of Europe's most mysterious cases. A young nursing student, Froka Liebs, left a pub after watching a FIFA World Cup game with friends and goes missing. What makes this case so mysterious is the fact that she was heard from but was never seen again. For a week, there was communication. On more than one occasion, she called or texted her roommate. In fact, there was at least one communique nearly every day for a week. Some more terrifying than others. All of this culminating into one very loud and scary end to the phone calls that her family prayed for each day. And then, there was silence, and then death. 
Froka Lieb's body was eventually found in a remote area called the Death Grounds. In some of the communications, the young woman didn't seem like herself. Was it really her? And regardless why, did the communication stop? Was this when she was killed? And just exactly who placed her body on the death grounds? This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of Froka Leaves. Froka Leaves was born February 21st, 1985. She grew up in Lebec, a small town of just about 26,000 people in northern Germany. She attended primary school and high school where she studied education. Froka's nature was that of a helper, so whenever possible, she was the type of person that she was always helping others, helping other people, even those she didn't know. After school, She did a one-year internship at an institution for the disabled. After this, she decided to move to a larger city and study nursing so she would have a wider range of job opportunities. So she moved to a city called Paderborn, or Paderborn. I've heard it pronounced both ways. This captain is a city that is located about an hour and 10 to an hour and 15 minutes away from her hometown. So it's not like she's moving clear across the country. She's moving to a somewhat nearby city. Froka made the move in October of 2005. And at that time, she was 21 years old. She was leaving behind her family of four, her mother, father, sister, and brother, all who would play key roles in our true crime story later. Of course, when they are trying to locate their loved one. And it's not like she was moving to an unknown city to herself or that she had no connections there. She was going to be moving in with a a lifelong friend. Not moving there completely on her own, as you said, Captain. She's already established a place to live. In this, she would be sharing an apartment in Paderborn with Christos Coriolis. So Christos went to school with Froka back in their hometown, and they had been in a relationship back when they were both teenagers. They broke up after four years together, but remained really good, tight friends. Froka dated someone else after Chris, but that had run its course as well, and when she moved to Paderborn, she was unattached. So she and Chris shared an apartment at Borchener Strauss 56. That's the address, each of them with their own bedrooms. But they would do a lot of things together here, Captain. They would grocery shop together, socialize somewhat together, and cooked and hung out together sometimes. But each was busy with his or her own life, their own schedule, their own friends, and their studies. Right. Chris had a girlfriend that he was seeing at the time, and Froka had a social circle of her own. Froka had only been in Paderborn for about nine months when our true crime tale picks up. During that time, she was studying nursing at St. Vincent's Hospital. Froka was very outgoing and a confident young woman. She was liked by everyone because of her giving nature, her friendliness, and her acceptance of all types of people. She made some really good friends through her nursing program and enjoyed going to pubs and clubs. She was a people person who loved being around others. Yeah, only in the city for nine months, but developed some relationships, close relationships, because one, she treated everybody like they were a friend, but it's a lot easier to move to a city if you have, one, a job. You're going to meet friends at that through that job, and especially when you're going to school with like-minded individuals, you're going to create a lot of relationships in a small amount of time. One thing that I think is key here that we should discuss, and this is something that we know about Froka, this according to all, they say that she was not the type to go home with someone that she did not know. 
It's well reported that she was intimate only with men if she was in a relationship with them, a long-term relationship with them. When we get to the details of the disappearance, it will be clear why we went out of our way to mention that here. Now, something that could have direct ties to her disappearance, she had a constant online presence under her moniker, Sweet Corey. In fact, she met a lot of her friends that way on various sites on the internet. Froka's mom said her daughter always had her phone in her hand and that texting was her number one hobby. Later, the lead investigator on her case, his name Rolf Osterman, would say she chatted with God and the world online, and his team has always suspected that her killer may have come across her there. Yep, we said killer. That's because, unfortunately, Froka was killed at the young age of just 21 years old. But first, weird stuff, almost hard to believe stuff, happened in this case. Let's go through the events leading up to her disappearance. This puts us at Tuesday, June 20th, 2006, and we have Ingrid, who is Froka's mom. She came to town to take Froka to dinner. Chris, the roommate, joined them, and the three went to a cafe. Froka's schoolmate and friend, her name is Isabella, text her at some point saying that her and some friends had a sweet spot at a local pub and the football games were on. That year, Germany was hosting the World Cup and Germans, like most people in the smart countries, love to go to pubs, drink beer, and watch football, no matter the definition applied to the name of the sport. Germany had won its match earlier that day. They defeated Ecuador three to nil, but the Sweden England match was scheduled for that night. So after Ingrid left, Chris dropped Froka off at the pub where Isabella and the other friends were. This is the old triangle Irish pub in Labori gallery neighborhood of Paderborn. Chris then went home. Now, Chris, for whatever reason, did not have his apartment key on him, so he took Froka's key after dropping her off. The arrangements were set. He told Froka he would wait up for her and let her in since the external door to the building would be locked. Now, this something, this is something, Captain, that might seem odd to people here in the States, that he drove to the cafe with the mom had dinner, drops her off, and then needs to take her key to the apartment. Because here in the States, we typically put our house and apartment keys on our key ring with our keys to our cars or our vehicles. Mm -hmm. There, they walk a lot of places and more often than not will walk. So it wouldn't be terribly uncommon to keep your keys separate. He left his key at the apartment, needed to take hers, and said he would wait up for her when she returned later that night. And probably because Germany was hosting the World Cup, that more Germans were just more excited about any matchup. And this pub was packed, and it was pretty rowdy for this event. And Germany was one of the favorites that year. They were one of the better teams that year, so there were high expectations for the Germany team. The crowd at the pub, like the captain said, They're having a good time. It's a loud crowd. They're engaged in the game. Froka's having fun with her friends. But she's also madly texting some guy named Niels. And remember, we have everybody telling us, especially her mother, Ingrid, said texting was her number one hobby. Right. So she's at the party, but busy on the phone. We all know that person. This would have drove me nuts. I would have said, get off your phone, pay Slap attention that to the game, be right present, the be present in the moment. I, I hate it when you're trying to visit with somebody and they're just texting away. It's, it's a sign of, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be hanging out with you. Well, in her defense, we'll say, you know, it's Sweden versus England. Mm-hmm. Maybe her head's not in the game. She's there being social, but the person that she's texting 
is this guy named Niels, and this is somebody that was recently introduced to her. So maybe she had an interest in pursuing right. Niels. And this was somebody that, in fact, her friend Isabella, who we already mentioned, introduced the two of them just a few weeks earlier. So it's not somebody that she just met online. She has met this person in person. Through a friend, through a good friend. And it sounds like Isabella knew this Niels for quite some time before making the introduction between the two. And according to Isabella, she thought that Niels and Froka hit it off real well and stating that their relationship was just as friends at this point in our timeline. Now, Niels was actually working a late shift that night, so he couldn't be there in person. Froka was trying to get him to come to the pub after his shift, but he had plans to go out with a friend to shoot some pool. After this texting, what we have here, Captain, she's on the phone so much, I don't know how much battery life she showed up to the pub with, but all this activity on her phone during the soccer match kills her phone's battery. So her friend Isabella gives her her phone battery so she can continue to text. The two shared the same common model of Nokia phone. Remember, Nokias were pretty popular in the early 2000s. Froka continued texting Niels after getting the new battery and even other people. Now, one thing we got to be clear here is we know that her and Niels were texting back and forth that night. Law enforcement has said that Froka was texting others. We have never received information as to who those others were, right? right. Um, we don't know if it was a whole bunch of other people, one other person. All we are told is that it was Niels and others during that game. The game wraps up around 11 p.m., and I question this time a little bit, uh, but not not big time. I bet you it's a little after 11 p.m., and we'll get into that very quickly. So Froka, after the game, she's going to want to get home. And she even indicated to her friends that she wanted to get home fairly quickly because she did not want Chris to have to wait up for her until the wee hours, right? Because he's got to wait up and let her in. So she leaves after telling her friends that she's going home on foot by herself that night. And as we know, unfortunately, she never made it home. Well, it's something that we need to probably explain a little bit because bar culture in America is a lot different than pub culture over in Europe. And I can't speak highly of, uh, or I can't speak that intelligently on the pub culture in Germany as it's probably different than England, but in England, a lot of pubs close at 11 PM, 12 PM. They don't stay open until the wee hours of the morning. So this is not Froka's final communication with a friend or a family member, as we talked about in today's trailer. So at 1249 a.m. on June 21st, she sent a text to her roommate, Chris. The text says, I will be home later. The game was fun. Not against England. Smiley face emoji. I-L-Y-V-M. See you later. So this text, according to Chris, makes total sense because he says that previously the two discussed that they were hoping that Germany would not have to play England in the first round. Right. As it got later and later and Froka not arriving home to the apartment, he tried to stay up. He, he, he wanted to stay up and let his roommate in. Eventually he has to go to bed, but before so he tries to call her on her phone and gets no answer. So eventually he decides to go to sleep with his bedroom door open, hoping that if she does arrive later than planned, that he would hear the doorbell, wake up, and he could let her in. And I don't think we have details of this call, because right when I hear that, oh, while well, the roommate trying to call her, did it go right to voicemail? I'm guessing that it didn't, just for the fact that it's never mentioned. It just 
He placed a call. She didn't answer. Correct. And what we do have here, th- this is one thing that's tricky about this case, is that the information regarding the text and the calls, a lot of that's coming from the persons that either received the call or the text or attempted to place a call. Right. Rather than law enforcement. So what we have here, you're exactly right, Captain. He may have tried more than once to call her, but according to what Chris has told everyone, he tried to call her. We don't know how many times. And his simple statement is that he got no answer. So eventually he decides to go to bed, hoping she would ring the door. He would let her in. That never happens. The next morning, Chris's phone rang and He's hoping it's his roommate, but it's not. It's Isabella, her friend, looking for Froka. Right. This because Froka did not show up for class that morning at 8 a.m. So Chris is going to investigate. He finds Froka's bed made and her room looked to be untouched. And he didn't hear her come in that night, knowing that she would be locked out. He quickly figures out she never came home. And he says this is incredibly well out of character for his roommate. So this puts Chris into like instant panic mode. He starts calling around. He calls Froka's family. Remember he, he had a relationship with her. She's his roommate. He went to dinner with her and her mother the night before he knows her family. Well, so he calls Ingrid Froka's mother and says, look, your daughter didn't come home last night. I'm worried. Her friend Isabella, who I dropped her off with last night, calls, says that Froka didn't show up for school this morning. Right. I'm worried. Character for. Exactly. And mom's now worried, too, because they both agree this is not normal for my daughter. This is not normal for my roommate. And this is why the question of when she left the pub becomes very important, because if she would have left right after 11 it doesn't take her that long to get back to her apartment. So you get this text almost, you know, closer to 1 a.m. saying, I'm going to be home soon. So then you go, well, if she left about 11, you got a two-hour gap there in time. Exactly. And here's the thing, too. What we have here is we have mom and roommate springing into action immediately. We like to see this in these cases. And we even have the two of them calling around. This is, you know, they're calling even hospitals to see if maybe she was involved in some kind of accident or, or, or whatever. Mom decides, Hey, I'm going to call the local police force and report my daughter missing. And she doesn't get the best information that she wants, right? First, they're saying, you know, you, you need to call the area where she's missing from And number two, she's not been missing for very long. She's an adult. She has the right to stay out all night and not come home to her apartment. She doesn't even live with you guys. And so Ingrid decides to take it up a notch, crank it up to 11. She called a friend, a personal friend on a local police force who then called an acquaintance on the Paderborn police. So now we have Paderborn who they're going to kind of work it a little bit, kind of work it on the DL. Um, but all, everything that they did that day, checking any accidents reports and so on, it turns up nothing. So again, we have family and friends who are ready to spring into action. They actually start putting up flyers later that very day. Uh, and these are just flyers saying, you know, asking for information, you know, call us if you, if you've seen her or if you know where she could be, but captain, I think you're honing in on something. And and I like the cut of your jib there, boy. Uh, let's examine what we can about Froka's walk home that night. The old triangle was located in the inner city part of Paderborn, whereas her apartment was South of that. So just about one point five kilometers. So less than a mile away. Right. There were essentially two routes that she could have taken on foot. I guess three, if you were going to count like one side road, which would lead to one of the main roads that she would have taken, but two primary routes. 
and a possible third. But so the first would be via Labori Berg cutting over to Woodakin Strauss. So this is about 1.3 kilometers. It's estimated to be approximately a 16 minute walking time. The second was exclusively via that very hard word to say road, Woodakin Strauss, also 1.3 kilometers. Again, about 16 minutes. Just to be clear, we don't need people sending us emails or comments on mispronunciations of any of these locations. Uh, We're doing the best we can and being as respectful as we can as we are just two dumb idiots in the garage. Well, I don't know that we're dumb idiots, but we are two garage guys that certainly yes, we are. flunked out of German in high school. I did not actually flunk out. I did take a one semester. I did not take any <laughs> semesters. The third route, Captain, was via Woodfried Strauss. This was the longest of the three potential routes that she could have taken. This is 1.6 kilometers with an estimated walking time of 20 minutes. So exactly what the captain pointed out just a few seconds ago, right? That this would have been a relatively quick walk. We have an estimated walking time of 16 to 20 minutes. So let's highlight a couple of items here before we move on. The approximate time of Froka leaving the pub, according to our notes, is sometime after 11 p.m. That text to Chris, her roommate, comes through at 1249 a.m. Remember, we just mapped out 16 to 20 minutes walking time for Froka. There's a big gap there between that text that comes in and the time that she left the pub. Even even if, let's say, at the far stretch of it, right? Friends saying that she left sometime after 11. Right. Nobody says she left at midnight or after midnight. I would believe that that would indicate that this is closer to 11 p.m., 11.10, 11.15 p.m., not closer to midnight. But let's say by some crazy chance that leaving after 11 p.m. to them ended up meaning 11 59 PM. Uh-huh. It still would, would not take her, you know, it still would not take her 50 minutes to walk from that pub to her apartment. It would take 16 to 20 minutes. Well, no. And again, it wouldn't take, like you said, it wouldn't take 50 minutes for her to walk back home. But also if you got back home in 50 minutes, you wouldn't be texting at your doorstep. Hey, I'm going to be home soon. Correct. So we have a, a few options here of what could have gone down. One, maybe the eyewitnesses were just completely wrong and it was past midnight. Closer to one. That seems unlikely to me. Or was there a pub on this route that maybe she could have stopped at? Maybe she had some friends at. Maybe she knew some of the workers there. But we have no evidence that that happened. What we do have evidence of is all night she's trying to get a gentleman to come out and see her. He already has plans. So it makes me wonder, did she decide I'm going to go meet up with him for just a little bit and then I'll head home? So what we have here, Captain, is on the short side of it, we are missing about 30 minutes of time. And to the great extent of it, it would be one hour and 45 minutes that is missing from our timeline here that are unaccounted for, for our victim. So much more to dive into with this case and so much more communication through the phone. And let's get back into this after this quick beer break. Many parents want to give their children extra academic support, but it can be overwhelming and expensive to get the right resources. IXL offers all the learning tools your family needs on one site, from pre-K to 12th grade, making it simple to identify exactly what each child needs to work on. With students learning in virtual classrooms recently, it's not uncommon for them to need a little extra review. IXL 
is the most comprehensive online learning program covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. It's a safe space for children to make mistakes and grow. On IXL, they'll find videos, lessons, and sample problems to break down tricky topics. When they get practice questions wrong, they'll get clear explanations. And as they master topics, they'll get positive feedback to help them build confidence and have fun learning. Memberships start at $9.95 per month, so it's much more affordable than a private tutor and more flexible. IXL is even proven effective by research. Studies nationwide have shown that students who use IXL are scoring higher on tests. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get 20% off IXL membership. Visit IXL.com garage today. The groundbreaking a and series 60 Days In returns with a new season. Seven new undercover volunteers are ready to go inside of one of the most dangerous jails and live among the inmates in the hopes of bringing reform. There's only one problem. In this place, there's nowhere to hide, making the experiment more intense and dangerous than ever. Who will fold under pressure and who will stay undercover long enough to make it to the end? Find out in a new season of 60 Days In, new episodes Thursday at 9, 8 central on A&E. This one goes out to all you craft real mayo lovers, to the sniffers, making excuses to run to the kitchen to open a jar and take a big whiff, and to the dippers, slathering their sandwiches in velvety smooth mayo and then dipping them in even more mayo. You just can't get enough, can you? And I haven't forgotten the fry painters. Some say frites, some say chips, but you all use that French fry golden goodness to deliver craft real mayo straight to your mouth. Let your mayo freak flag fly. With Instacart, you can get groceries and more delivered from over 1,000 stores and 75,000 locations. So whether you need a massive haul from a wholesale club, everyday essentials from your go-to supermarket, or specialty items from your favorite local grocer, you can get whatever you need delivered in as fast as an hour. You can even shop for pet supplies, electronics, and sporting goods in just a few clicks. Visit instacart.com to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. $10 minimum per order. Additional terms apply. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates, and cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, Captain. Cheers to the people in the sides and the back. Now, what has to be said about this case is that the police were slow to take the case on. Part of that is precisely because of the factors that make this case so intriguing. We have communications from the victim, who at the time is just simply missing, and may not be a victim at all as far as law enforcement is concerned, or there's no evidence to suggest that she's a victim of any type of foul play. So we have these communications that, for the most part, do not seem to indicate foul play, but those who know Froca say differently. The family and Chris, her roommate, told the police that Froca was reaching out in apparent distress. Now, not from this first communication, but we're going to see additional ones that we are going to get into real quick. But because the police were not involved in the investigation, the calls, unfortunately, were not recorded and thus had to be reconstructed from memory. We need to point out here, Captain, that different publications in Germany have different wording, but we are going to do the very best to give you the gist of what was said. Well, right. And again, we know with eyewitness reports, there's going to be some level of error. And that happens also when you're an ear witness. Right. They're, again, they're giving these statements off of memory because there is no recording. The text, different situation. That's easy to, to research and, and figure out the wording. So Froca is gone for months before her body is found. But for about the first week that she is gone, there are these, what could be deemed as somewhat normal, somewhat abnormal, and somewhat cryptic communications via calls and text from Froca before the silence. Most of the communications were with her friend and roommate, Chris. So let's go through this communication timeline here. June 20th, sometime after 11 p.m., 
she leaves the pub. June 21st, 1249 a.m., there's a text sent. This is the one that we've already discussed saying, I will be home later. The game was fun. Then, Captain, we have nothing until roughly 45 and a half hours later. So a lot of time goes by. This is when we got family and friends putting up posters. They're looking for her. They're calling people, trying to locate Froka. They get nothing. But what they do get is 45 and a half hours after that text that came to Chris, there's a phone call. This is on June 22nd. Chris was at his father's house when his phone rang at 10.25 p.m. It was Froka. She says, hello, Christos. I wanted to say that I am fine and that I'll be home soon. Tell mom and dad and the others. She hung up immediately. Chris did not have an opportunity to ask Froka any questions about where she was or what she was up to or why she's been gone for so long. Chris, who arguably knew Froka better than anyone else at the time, was alarmed by this brief call. And he went on to tell the media and law enforcement that for one part of it, he he said that Froka didn't sound like herself. She was speaking in a very monotone voice. Her voice was very flat. He said that she was usually very animated and she called him Christos, which he says rarely happened that Froko would usually call him Chris and only used Christos when she was angry at him. Yeah. It makes me wonder if this was a recorded message. I think that's a good point. I, I think what we may have here, captain is the chance that this could be, Either, like you said, a recorded message or if she's being watched and maybe a script was laid out for her. Right. And any variation of this script that I've, I, I'm telling you that you can, you can say, we're going to have a big problem. And we can't, it's difficult for us to sit here in the garage and have any clue what the repercussions of that may be. So, yeah, and, and. A couple of things here. If if you're Christos, is your one you're going okay? Weird interaction or lack of interaction on the phone, but you know people go missing. Maybe she went to a friend's house. You know, maybe there was an accident. Maybe something happened. I'll get the answers later tonight when I get home. But but you definitely think that there would be some red flags popping up in his mind. Oh yeah. Big time red flags. And so he is immediately alarmed by this call. I it's weird, right? Because there's gotta be some relief balanced by that of alarm. There's relief because she finally called. She's been missing now for, like we said, almost 48 hours, almost two days, but alarm because she doesn't sound like herself. And she's to me, when I review that call, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I, and I, we can get into to the wording of everything, but the actions that happen immediately is Chris calling Froka's family. And he's like, look, I just received this call. Immediately, they're telling him, look, we understand why she would call you first and not us. Right. Because you're the roommate. Uh, we are harder to get a hold of than Christos is. And... She was last in communication with you. She likely would be the first one to see you. Would she return? And on top of that, they live in another city. Yeah, he's local. Exactly. So he he tries to relay best he can what the wording of the call was and why he was alarmed by the call. And they agreed that they, too, were concerned about the call. So now... The family, Froka's family and Chris, they all gathered together at the apartment, at Froka's apartment, to wait for her. After all, she said she'd be home soon. And unfortunately, again, she never arrives. Of course, they're trying to call her cell. Right. But those calls were not answered. And there's, 
I don't think there's a lot of details on, on when they started trying to call her. Because, look, if I talked to somebody and I thought the interaction was strange or there wasn't interaction on the phone, I might try to text that individual or call them right back. But there's no indication that that happened. There's also no indication that that did not happen. Right. So what I think here is likely that, I mean, that we we are told that there are several calls placed to her cell by multiple people after that phone call. Look, if you talk to a friend on the phone and they, they, they call and give you two, they've been missing for two days and give you two sentences and then hang up and don't even say goodbye. I think I'm calling back right away. Right. So let's review this real quick. Hello, Christos. I wanted to say I am fine and that I'll be home soon. Tell mom and dad and the others. Hang up. Yeah, here's my thing about the, the Christos, right? She doesn't call him that. But if, okay, let's just say she's, she's at this point, we, we believe that she was kidnapped, right? Correct. I do, yeah. So the kidnapper is saying, who are we going to call? We got to call somebody. Oh, we can call my friend Christos. And that's probably what she would tell a stranger. His name, right? She'd use his full name. She's not going to tell a stranger, you know, well, his name is Christos, but I actually call him Chris. And it, Or it could be by design on her part to say, yeah, we're going to call Christos. I'm going to use the term Christos because it's going to spark a red flag in his brain of why is she calling me by my full name? I think you're, see, that's where I think you're exactly right, Captain, because we know she's a smart young woman. You know, she's educated. Uh, she's hardworking. We know that she's personable. She's outgoing. So she's probably a fairly good communicator. What I'm getting at here is that, that those two sentences make no sense. I get what Chris is saying. She called me Christos. That's weird. But one thing here that, is a possibility is, is he saved? Is his, is his contact information saved in her phone under Christos and not Chris? Right. And if this message that she's giving is scripted by someone else, as you pointed out, they would not know that she calls him Chris. They would only know that when her phone rang 40, you know, hours ago when she was late getting home, never came home and he starts calling her phone. It kept coming up Christos, kept coming up Christos. If you are trying to hide something or if you are trying to scrub the trail and do that by communicating, the person you're going to reach out to is the person that was calling repeatedly the night that you abducted this young woman. Yeah, and the person that they last had text communication with. I'll be home shortly. Here's the other thing, too. The last sentence, tell mom and dad and the others. I'll be home soon. Tell mom and dad and the others. If I'm talking to my friend, uh -huh. I'm saying, tell my mom and dad and the others. If I'm talking to my brother or sister, I would say, tell mom and dad and the others. Right. Because we share the mother and the father. Uh, to me, it, it almost looks like a couple things. Not just that the the person that, that scripted this did not know to call him Chris, but also may have made an assumption that they were that was her brother. Right. So there there's a bunch of things here. And and when we cross reference this communication, that yes, this is a phone call, and the prior communication forty five and a half hours earlier was a text. But in that text, Captain, that to me seems like that's her, right? There's the inside joke or the inside mention of a reference to, hey, something we talked about earlier, England winning we didn't, or England tying. I believe they ended up tying that game. Right. But uh, enjoyed the game. All of that seems like, like very personable stuff. Some of it even personable between her and Christos where this almost seems very disconnected from Froka's life and Christos, their relationship. Like the person that put these words together does not fully understand the meaning of their relationship. Yeah, but riddle me this, Batman. 
if you're the kidnapper, why let her have any communication at all? That's a good question. Because that's you, a psychosis that I cannot <laughs> sit here and claim to have an understanding of. Because if you're trying to buy some time, right? You make the call earlier in the day and you go, okay, well, I'm going to be home shortly. I'll be home this evening. So now you got this time period where people are going to be waiting. Oh, she made a communication. She's going to be home. The early evening comes. We can't find her. We'll wait a little bit longer. Okay, now we start commu- trying to contact her phone. But it's so late that it's like, well, I'm going to be home shortly. It's, it's now a very small window that if she doesn't return home, you're questioning this call anyways, but, but I don't see what the purpose for the kidnapper would be that's, other than some like, that's why when we came back from the break, I pointed out the communications because what we do know happened in this case, the police were slow to get involved because of these communications. Right. So if that was the purpose of the abductor allowing this to happen, job well done it fucking worked (laughs) it It, worked and then now let's go back to the to the sick end of end of it the psychosis end of it larry gene bell who we talked at serial killer that we talked about talked to john douglas about he abducted two different girls and uh for his own pleasure allowed them to communicate with their family members in fact he communicated with their family members in conversation So it could either be to throw the cops off so they don't get involved, like we know happened here, or it could just be some kind of sick fetish, some kind of sadistic torture that this person chose to roll out on this victim. Yeah. It's a, it's a mind, it's a mind F situation. Yeah. And I also think maybe you have this person, you kidnapped them. They're now a prisoner, and you're trying to show them some good faith. I keep telling you, if you just do what I ask you to, you'll live, right? Mm-hmm. So in good faith, it, you you did what I asked you to do. I'm going to let you call home. Right. We, you have a hostage situation. What happens? We need you to, you got, you got 20 people held hostage. We need you to send out one. Oh, you, you want us to send in food? And, and uh you know, this or that on your list of demands. Well, we need something in trade. We need you to send out uh, two hostages and right. we'll give you this. And I think we talked about this a little bit in the Oakland County child killer case. Remember in that case, one thing that people were fascinated by is that all of the victims, when they were recovered, it was reported that they were clean, even though they had been missing for days and days and days, right. that they were clean and appeared to be well fed. I've always believed in that case, and we know that there is a huge sexual element to that case. I've always believed that whatever was being done to those victims, part of it may have been in trade. Saying, okay, yeah, I look, I don't want to have to fight you or force you to do this, but I will if I have to. But if you if you make it easy on me, well, you'll get pizza for dinner. You'll get to take a shower. Uh, you'll get clean clothes. Yeah, you'll be able to make contact with the loved one. In this situation, like you said, it may be that they have promised, look, I, I know that you don't want to be here. I know that I'm holding you against your will. I know that I'm doing things to you that you do not like, that are horrible. But if you don't make this any more difficult than it has to be, I will let you live. And proof of that is... Oh, here's, here's the little, you know, just like you give a dog a treat. Here's the little treat, the little reward, quick phone call to your roommate or quick phone call to person who was calling you two days ago. This is proof of, of, of my word of my handshake that yes, I will let you go. If you don't make this any more difficult than it has to be. One, it could be also all three happening at the same time. Yep. You know, I'm going to make this deal with you, but I kind of get off on the idea of you making contact anyways, but I'm going to control that situation too. And by controlling that situation and having you do what I say, there's a a type of 
um, gratification or there's some type of enjoyment that I get out of controlling that situation. And also maybe this puts the, the police off for a little bit. Okay, great. That gives me some more time because the more, especially with a kidnapped victim, you're going to keep that victim in your possession as long as you feel that you're safe and that nobody's on to you. You don't have to get to the end of do I release her or do do I kill her and have to dispose of her. You don't have to get to that crossroads until you feel a, a, sens- a, a sense of urgency or a sense of uh, or or the fear of being caught grows even more, if that makes any sense. So one of the, and th- this is very, this is hardly ever reported on, but one of the items we we've talked on this show about extensively about when John Douglas and Robert wrestler would go travel around the country and interview these different serial offenders, serial killers who have been apprehended and some of them in, you know, locked up for years and they would interview them for hours And one thing that they learned from a lot of the killers, the serial killers, were things that the serial killer was trying to uh, improve on with each victim. What he was learning from the first victim, the mistakes he made, and ways that he could make the experience better for him with victim number two and make it less likely for him to get caught with victim number two or anything that anything he thought was too risky with victim one. Of course, they're trying to learn that. But one thing that is very scary that some of the serial killers, this would be the sadist that said this to wrestler and Douglas. One thing they were trying to learn or one thing they were surprised of with victim number one is it they thought they died too quickly or died too easily. Some of the things they wanted to do to the victim, they weren't able to do to them because they died in the course of the torture. And they were trying to learn how they could torture the victim longer before they died. And so that's one thing that we could be seeing here as well, because what we do know about this case is, is that she, unfortunately, whatever was going on, whatever was happening, she, unfortunately, was alive. There's no disputing that for about a week after she disappeared. Now, Rolf Osterman, who we've already talked about, he would be the lead investigator on this case. He would later say that this is when the, the, the family became aware that she was being held hostage. That's when they first firmly believe that, you know what, this is confirmation of her being held hostage. She calls with a two sentence call and hangs up and the the call doesn't make sense. And and she's not responding to our calls. Right. Well, again, it's like the two lines. I'm not that worried about. It's the fact that there's, it's not a communication. It's not, there's no interaction. Right. That's so bizarre. I mean, could you imagine you? This person has been missing for a couple of days. You've been worried sick. Now they're talking to you, and and you say something, and they just hang up the phone. That's. I mean that that would be very difficult. The TV stations started showing Froka's photo at this time, and. The police, they spoke with everyone that they could think of. This would be Froka's friends, co-workers, and schoolmates to see if she could possibly have left town with any of them. They spoke with everyone that was at the pub that night. They, they did their best to track all of them down and talk to them. They go out and they speak with Niels, the, the newish friend that she had. And he says that he has no idea where Froka could be. On Friday, June 23rd at 11.04 p.m., Chris receives a text from Froka's phone 
This text says, I'm coming back home today. I'm in Paderborn or Paderborn. Chris got no response when he texted her back. He again tells Froka's family that he received a text saying that she's coming home. Froka's brother, Frank, hearing that her phone was back on, he tries calling her and she picked up. Well, and see here, here's what I wonder too is, so she again makes a short call statement. I, I'm uh, I'm in Paderborn. I'm coming home. Almost implying that she was somewhere else. I was in another city. Now I'm here, coming home, and I'm guessing that there was extensive amounts of calls back to her phone to the point where somebody said, "I, I got to let her answer." Yeah, this is her brother, Frank, and here's how he remembers the call. Frank says that he said, Froka, where are you? What are you doing? When are you coming home? Froka responds, I'm coming home today, not too late. I'm in Paderborn or Paderborn. Don't ask, I will be coming home. Frank then says, where are you? Froka says, I can't say, and then she hangs up the phone. And he, he would say, her brother would say that she sounded normal alert but cryptic almost like she's yeah somebody's watching her yeah and so now we have the family who they wait in her apartment all night long again nothing again i think some of this stuff comes down to maybe the kidnapper thought he was going to let her go but he, again, wasn't at that crossroads yet. And you, once you get to that crossroads, then you have to, he has to then fully decide, he has to fully commit. If I let her go, what are the chances that this comes back to me? And the police are still not heavily involved in this case. But what we have at this time is, remember, we have her picture that's being broadcast on news stations. And we have the police who are issuing a statement asking Froka to please contact her family. The next call was to the roommate again, to Chris. This takes place on June 24th at 2.22 p.m. So this is two days after her first call to Chris. This is two days after and one day after the communication via text to Chris and the uh, phone call from her brother. So note, this is the only communication in the series that takes place during daytime hours. All the other calls in text so far have been late at night. And this call is again to the roommate and it's, Froka saying, I'm not coming back so late. I come home tonight. Chris says, are you hurt? Froka says, no, I'm in Paderborn. I'm in Paderborn. I'm in Paderborn. And then hangs up the phone. And of course, anybody's going to think that this is weird. Why would anybody mention the city Paderborn three times in a row? But of course, Chris and Froka's family, they're saying that they believe that this was some type of message that she's trying to, to deliver some type of message to them. Chris did. Um, sorry. Chris did describe Froka's voice as sounding blurry is the word that he used. And by this, I'm wondering if he means that she was slurring her words or sounded sleepy something of that nature right or or is he talking about the connection again the, the big misstep here is that police are not involved they're not involved it seems like because of these communications which is ridiculous and so nobody's recording these calls to me these communications that are strange is an indication that we should be involved if this girl goes missing and a couple of days later, they're getting these weird 
communications with the family. At this point, it's it's even more hands on deck because, look, people call all the time, hey, uh, a family member of ours didn't show up to school today. It's very unlike them. Please go, okay, well, we'll take a note of this, but hey, if you make contact with her or she shows up, please let us know. And a high percentage of missing person cases, that's how it ends. A couple hours later, they find the person, open and shut case. But what doesn't happen that often is these weird cryptic communications. So if the family then calls and says, hey, you know, remember when we told you our, our loved one didn't show up for school? Well, a couple of days later, we get this weird call from her. And we've had weird communications with her. If I'm law enforcement, to me, I'm going, ding, 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 ding. This person is now endangered. They're in a dangerous situation. All hands on deck. Because we still, at this point, we know that she's alive. We have the possibility, if we find her, we could save her. And it's almost like, in this case, law enforcement did the opposite. I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage and sharing these cases on social media and telling your friends about the garage podcast until tomorrow. Be good, be kind, and don't litter. The groundbreaking AME series 60 Days In returns with a new season. Seven new undercover volunteers are ready to go inside of one of the most dangerous jails and live among the inmates in the hopes of bringing reform. There's only one problem. In this place, there's nowhere to hide, making the experiment more intense and dangerous than ever. Who will fold under pressure and who will stay undercover long enough to make it to the end? Find out in a new season of 60 Days In new episodes Thursday at 9, 8 central on A&E.